Um, I want to welcome all of you to the pre-elementary curriculum night. <clears throat> Our group of eight teachers have put together a comprehensive overview of the five core curricular areas in the pre-elementary Montessori classrooms. Each teacher will be introduced just before presenting. Please enter any questions you have into chat and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Our goal tonight is to focus on the intellectual, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual development of the children in our care. Please remain muted throughout the entire presentation. Thank you. So Susan Bassalieri will start us off on our learning journey. Susan. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us all as we explore the five core curriculum areas of our Montessori classroom environments. These areas are practical life, sensorial, math, language, and cultural studies. Throughout the presentation, you will hear about materials that offer your child concrete experiences that illustrate concepts. It is through understanding concepts that abstract thought is constructed. We will be sharing with you what materials are used and why we use them. What I wish we could share, however, is how these materials create joy-filled learning experiences for the children. Simple pouring activities quietly become imaginary tea parties designing the hotel with the 10 pink cubes and the 10 rectangular prisms is fun pattern reading, but discovering how those 10 cylinders can live in the building is magical. When the children stack 9,000 cubes atop each other, they are truly convinced that 9,000 is a really big number and nothing compares to the silliness of learning how to rhyme. These are the experiences that bring smiles to oh, yeah. us in Eaton's pre-elementary classrooms. And I get to start off today with our practical life area. And as Dr. Montessori said, to assist a child, we must provide him with an environment which will enable him to develop freely. I made a penny shiny. I twisted things. I hammered nails. I used a shuttle. These are the answers that many parents may hear from their children at the end of the day. These are the exercises from the practical life curriculum area in your child's classroom. What is practical life? Well, practical means basic, useful, purposeful. And life is a, means the way of living. And practical life is just that. These are exercises so that the children can learn how to do living activities in a purposeful way. It is in this area that the young child may first engage in purposeful movement, develop muscle control and coordination, experience independence and strengthen concentration. It is where they get to acquire a sense of responsibility and community. It is in the exercises of practical life that a solid foundation for future learning is built. Gaining strength to hold a pencil correctly comes from the many activities that refine the pincer grip. During the first few weeks of school, many initial exercises are offered to the children that do just that. As Dr. Montessori said, the hand is the instrument in, of the brain. And indeed, the children eagerly embrace these activities with their small and capable hands. A short five second presentation from the teacher is all the child needs to get to work. Refining and strengthening the pen pincer grip, how they hold a pencil, is the direct aim. But other things are going on in these slides and these exercises as well. The slide on the far left with the colored pins 
that also offers opportunities to match colors and do patterning. But the teacher doesn't present it that way. The children discover that on their own. The middle slide demonstrates one-to-one -one correspondence, the very basic foundation to developing mathematical awareness. The slide on the far right demonst uh, re requires a bit more refined motor control and depending on the design being created, it needs a strong ability to stay on task. All of these activities allow for self-assessment. The child doesn't need anyone to tell them if the activity is complete. Leftover pieces do that. They also or, um, offer a sense of completion. The child has finished something. Often we just tell our children to go play, but when is play done? All the exercises in practical life build in a cycle of activity. The child chooses, the, makes the choice, chooses what they want to do, collects all the necessary materials, experiences the lesson, and then puts it away for the next person. Completion builds confidence, and confidence then motivates everyone to work more. Just like it is for adults, it's that way for children as well. And a positive learning cycle from an activity that may only take three minutes for the youngest children. Here's another activity that refines the pincer grip. She's stringing beads, but more things are going on as well. She's reading the pattern that's on the box of beads. She recreates that pattern when she takes the beads out and arranges them accordingly. And then she's stringing them, just following the pattern. This little girl is spooning again with strong muscle control, but she's also doing it left to right the same way that we read. Working with water is of major interest to our pre-elementary students. From the initial sponge squeezing lesson to one-to-one -one pouring to pumpkin, truck, or table scrubbing, there can be sev several different water activities in a classroom at any given time. And learning to pour is the direct aim, but again, more things are going on. Look at Elaine's attention to detail. This is the same detail that's needed when, to count accurately when doing uh, activities from the math shelves. And it's the same attention to detail needed to follow stories and discussions with comprehension. Math concepts are also built in our practical life areas. This little girl is pouring from one to two containers. So she is working on measurement and estimation. Again, there's self-assessment. Once again, the child does not need an adult to point out any mistakes. And repetition builds mastery. Back and forth, back and forth, the child pours with concentration and purpose. The Montessori hand washing sequence is one of the first complex activities on which the children are presented early on in the school year. This multi-step exercise details many, many of the indirect aims already mentioned, along with the crucial component of sequencing. The ability to sequence steps is necessary in all aspects of learning being able to follow the plot of a story, understanding the steps to solve complex mathematical operations, and my personal challenge, understanding how to read Lego instructions. They all require sequencing skills. You may recognize how this exercise scaffolds on skills previously introduced, lots of transporting water-filled containers, lots of pouring, strong muscle uh, sponge squeezing. The activities across the curriculum areas are sequenced according to skills already introduced. The children get to practice what they already know and then have to only truly focus on one or two new skills or concepts. Caring for ourselves and our environment is the basis for peace education. 
And the young students in our classrooms work on this daily. Washing hands, most definitely in these times, is caring for oneself and for others. Putting on one's jacket, working on the dressing frames, brushing teeth, opening a lunchbox are all care of self exercises. And what happens after one learns to care for themselves, they can learn to care for another. This kind of leads on to something else. The children begin to learn to ask for help. Asking for help is the first step in problem solving. No one is expected to put that jacket on and zip it up on the very first day of school. It does not take long, however, for the children to first come to an adult to ask for help. And then soon enough, an older student may come over and offer to help. That's another indirect aim. They're beginning to care for their community and contribute to that community. Caring for the environment meets the human need of belonging to a community. Knowing that they can help in the classroom, both indoors and out, gives the children a sense of responsibility and increases their self-worth. From the beginning of the year, the youngest students cheerfully fold up the snack mats and the cleaning cloths as they come out of the laundry. They learn how to, uh, they practice doing little sweeping activities so that they can sweep up their own tables after lunch. And many children give up part of their recess time to volunteer and go sweep the wood chips off the sidewalks outside. The exercises shown in the slides are some of the initial exercises presented. These basic activities initiate the lengthening of concentration. These 10 second pouring exercises lead a child to spend 10 minutes scrubbing a table. Watering a plant leads a child to rolling a seed pot out of newspaper and planting a seed. Bead stringing leads to embroidery and weaving projects. And if a child can squeeze a sponge, that child before long will be using a handsaw at the woodworking table. Now we get to move to the most colorful area in our environments, the sensorial area. And Ms. Kalsam Wally will be presenting that for us. Hi everybody, good evening. Um, so sensorial, colorful, and it can be a little bit noisy, but a lot of fun. So um, the sensorial area is where children spend time developing and refining their senses. Um, so the primary purpose of sensorial materials are just that, to refine and develop their different senses. Each material isolates a certain concept that the child will discover. For example, like pink cubes, uh, they're all the same color, they same shape, they're all cubes, but different in size. And all these concrete materials make concepts really real for them and therefore easily internalized. There are many beginning processing skills that children will develop here. Um, they need all these skills so that they'll be more ready for abstract representations of numerals and alphabet. And these skills include identifying, describing attributes, matching, sorting, comparing, and order, ordering. So the sensorial activities provide a cognitive foundation in becoming a careful observer and an independent conceptual thinker. So in this slide, um, we'll talk about visual discrimination skills. It is uh, the ability to determine differences and similarities. It allows students to identify and recognize the likeness and differences of shapes forms, colors, and position of objects. Children develop this ability through their work with the concrete materials like pink cubes, 
rectangular prisms, the red rods, and, and many, many more. So the act of arranging helped children to develop a range of thinking skills and built the foundation for later problem solving. Concentration, we see a lot of this kind of concentration while they're trying to get that one last the smallest cylinder at the top because it's not that easy. So it takes concentration. And Montessori pointed out that the child's entire personality is transformed by their growing ability to concentrate as they become more and more in control of their own mind and their own body. As children move back and forth from their workspace to the shelf to retrieve all the material that they need, this helps develop their independence, their sense of order, and their gross motor skills. Whether a child is stacking or arranging things in a certain way, they are developing their spatial awareness skills the picture shows a child who had carefully arranged the red rods to build a maze, followed by walking through the narrow space with great balance and coordination. Patterning skills. Children are developing higher level of thinking as they make a pattern using two or maybe three sets of materials. Patterns help children learn to make predictions to understand what comes next, to make logical connections, and to use reasoning skills. All these skills will get them more equipped to work with math activities. Chromatic sense. Children learn to perceive differences between primary and secondary colors as well as the various gradations of each color. And then children also develop a lot of vocabulary as they learn the different names for triangles. They learn to use specific names for shapes like large gray equilateral triangle or small blue scalene triangle and so on. And in the geometry area, children built a better understanding of relationships between plane figures, as well as the ability to discriminate the different solid figures that they see around them. And again, they use specific names for these um, solid figures. And Finally, we'll talk about collaboration among students. We often would see children two, sometimes three, work together to achieve a goal of constructing. Like in this case, um, they're building a pyramid uh, using several sets of materials. So there's a lot of um, materials to take to the rugs. So this collaboration helps increase the interpersonal skills they, as they share ideas and responsibilities and take turns and solve problems together. The sensorial area easily leads into math, and that curriculum area will be shared by Madeline Lee and Lynette Oshiro. Maybe. Let's see. Madeline. Madeline, you're on, you're muted. Sorry. 
<laughs> All right, we'll try this again. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Children are exposed to numbers at an early age. As parents, we often teach toddlers to hold up one or two fingers to show their age. Children come to school sometimes counting one to 10 or even one to 50. At this point, we use concrete objects to begin the math journey. Before showing numerical symbols, we begin with one-to-one -one correspondence. As mentioned earlier in practical life and sensorial activities, they set the stage. These activities show exactness, sequence, and order. Matching stones to circles is an activity related to the short bead stair used in Montessori math. And the matching shells to individual sections can be used both in practical life for fine motor skills and in math for one-to-one -one correspondence. By counting, children become aware of quantity. By matching these quantities, five is five, whether it is five flowers or five pencils. The number of rods in the picture on the right show that 10 is a lot more than one. The sandpaper numerals introduces the symbols zero to nine. Children trace the numerals with two fingers for tactile, what's going on? and muscle memory of each. Early in my career, I had a child who worked in the sandpaper numerals for months. We reviewed them every few days. He could count objects, but he could not remember the symbols. Then one day it just clicked. He had an aha moment and had a look of joy on his face of, of accomplishment. From that point on, he quickly picked up other math concepts. He internalized the basics for foundation for future math. So glad I did not rush him. Once children are confident with quantities and symbols, we use concrete materials to make that association. The spindle box is counting from zero to nine. The teens show counting and place values of tens and units. <clears throat> When the children are ready, we begin linear counting. The 100 board on the left is laying tiles 1 to 100 in numerical order. It shows the patterns of numerals, the patterning skill that children also practice with the sensorial materials. With linear counting, we're moving from using concrete materials to more abstract concepts. The seven square chain on the right shows skip counting and is a preparation for multiplication as the labels are multiples of seven. With all activities, the children are free to practice as many times as they wish to feel confident. The lessons are fluid so children can always go back to the more concrete activities while working on abstract ones. There is no test or timetable for the children to follow. In a Montessori classroom, mathematics is approached in a tangible way and focuses on the process of our young learners. Montessori students use hands-on learning that create a tactile experience for the child. Manipulatives allow the child to use their sense of touch to grasp mathematical concepts of quantity and it helps make abstract concepts clear and concrete. When children work with these fascinating educational tools. It brings them joy and excitement to see and explore what is going on as each math process unfolds before their eyes. This approach to teaching mathematics offers a strong and logical strategy for helping students understand and develop a sound foundation in mathematics. The math materials are sequential and once the child shows readiness, for the next material, he or she is prepared to move on to the next lesson and concept. The introduction tray, as you see in the photo on the left, is the first lesson a child is given to introduce the child to the concept of the decimal system. They learn about the crisis of nine, and yes, it sounds like a natural disaster, and it really could be if it was introduced in an abstract form. 
By adding one to nine, the amount automatically carries over in place value to the tens place. A single bead by itself represents a unit of one. 10 unit beads strung together on a wire represents a unit of 10. The children quickly discover that 10 unit beads is exactly the same as one 10 bar. 10 10 bead bars equal 100 square. And a 10 100 square stacked one on top of the other form a square containing 1,000 cube. In the middle photo, a child is building the hierarchical bird's eye view, also known as the 45 layout that is introduced to the decimal system. The 45 layout is setting up quantities from one unit to nine units, then 10 to 90, 10 bars, 100 to 900 squares, and 1,000 to 9,000 cubes. Numer cards are used for each match and matched with the quantity represented by the golden beads. The name 45 refers layout refers to the 45 unit beads, 4,500 squares, and 45,000 cubes that are required to complete the activity. Using these concrete materials, young children can build four digit numbers. Here, a child in the photo on the right is working on the fetching game. The teacher or her partner might say, please fetch 1,507 or 1,578. She then finds the numerals and goes to the bank to get the quantity and places it above the number it represents. For math operation, the first lesson is called the bank game. The bank is the name given to the collection of golden bead materials. Using the golden bead material, the child can build two four digit numbers together. By going through the steps of addition in this concrete manner, the child has a clear impression about what addition means. Here a child is adding without exchange or carrying over which we call static addition. Once a child shows competence and understanding of static addition with practice, he is ready for exchange, which is called dynamic addition. He may work with a partner and they take turns being the banker. At this stage, they know that if they have 10 units, they understand that 10 has its own place. They will need to exchange it for a 10 bar. They say banker, I would like to exchange 10 units for one 10 bar, please. The next steps would be multiplication, then subtraction, and then eventually division with the golden bead materials. In the Montessori classroom, children also practice math facts in all the operations with supporting materials with built-in control of error to build confidence in our students. The addition strip board on the left and the multiplication bead board on the right also offers another pathway to abstraction. The children learn about time, money, and measurement. Measurement is explored throughout the classroom, as you can see on the photo on the bottom left. A child is measuring beads using measuring spoons in the practical life area. Children may also use the red rods in the sensorial area to measure the distance from a classroom that is across from their classroom or how long an object is. In the photo on the top left, a child is working on a clock activity to help her understand how to tell time. Math is also incorporated to tell time. They need to know how to skip count by fives as they have done with the square and cube chains and with other Montessori math materials to have an understanding of numbers on a clock. Children are also expo exposed to the calendar, months and days of the year, night and day, seasons, and the timeline to also learn about time. President's Day is in February, and this is a great time for the children to learn about money. Thank you, Lynette. And now we get to language. 
with Michelle Lee and Holly Fleming. Good afternoon. Um, next slide, please. Montessori classrooms are rife with opportunities for young children to develop oral language skills. During work time, there is often a low hum of activity and voices that children interact and participate in lessons. At teacher initiate group times, children are encouraged to contribute verbally to discussion. They learn conversational grace and courtesy skill by taking turns to speak. Sharing an item from home uh, as seen in this photo gives children an introduction to public speaking. Students learn to sequence material by length, width, and height using sensory materials. Those sequencing skills become more abstract in the language area. Pictorial story sequencing card challenge children to uh, recognize and organize a story. What happened first? Then what happened? What's next? What happened last? This simple activity tells the teacher a great deal about the child's visual comprehension, reasoning, and enunciation skills. Children are also given lessons on identifying and matching objects such as up, down, inside, outside, full, empty, close, open, or back, front. This, uh, this activity shows that the child understands relationships of objects and can articulate the different facets. Using objects or pictures, children learn rhyming words such as house, mouse, car, star, and tail, mail. This valuable skill helps them hear and identify the middle and ending sounds in words. Children love to listen to rhyming stories and poems often excitedly calling out, that's a rhyming book. Children are developing many pre-writing um, skills in practical life and sensory curriculum areas of the classroom. Examples in practical life include manipulating Play-Doh, transferring objects with tweezers, and opening and closing the button frame. In Sensorio, the knob cylinders are designed to develop the three finger pencil grip. The child on the left is pin poking. She uses a wooden stylus with a short metal point or a push pin to poke holes on an outline. This activity develops eye hand coordination and the pencil grip needed for handwriting. Pin poking activities are common extension to sensorial and cultural work. For example, a child can pin poke, pin poke polygon shapes from the geometric uh, cabinet or an animal she's learning about in zoology. The child on the right is tracing metal in the shapes. This activity helps to further develop the pencil grade for handwriting. Students extend this activity by striping lines from left to right or top to bottom inside the shape they trace. Children can make creative design including zigzag lines, waves, or patterns such as line dot, line dot. The metal insect shape correspond with shapes in the sensorial geometry cabinet. Then paper letters are core Montessori language material. The child traces the uh, shape of each lowercase letter with his fingers. He learns to connect phonetic sound with the abstract letter shape. For example, the child traces the same paper letter S with his fingers and names the object scissors, spider, and soap. Once the once the child knows all phonetic alphabet sounds, she is ready to sort mix objects by their beginning sounds. At this point, the child can hear each beginning sound and see the abstract letter shape. Later, children are challenged to sort objects by the middle so, uh, short vowel sound, a, e, e, a, o. This leads to beginning word building activity in which the child 
finds the missing sounds in phonetic words? Word building. When a child can confidently sort objects and pictures by their beginning sounds and find missing sounds in short words, he is ready to begin word building. The student on the left is building three letter phonetic words such as top, pup, cop, cup, and mop. She is using the movable alphabet, which contains several wooden cutouts of each letter with vowels in one color, consonants in another color. The child says the name of the object or picture, listens for each phonetic sound, and builds the word. Later, she matches the word cards to check her work and corrects any errors by simply replacing an incorrect letter into the movable alphabet and finding the correct letter. The movable alphabet can be used throughout the classroom. Children can build stories using pictorial sequencing cards, describe a sensorial structure they built, or explain about a plant from botany. Because English is not a completely phonetic language, it is expected that children will use inventive spelling. For instance, of may be spelled UV. When children become proficient with three letter phonetic words, they advance to building longer phonetic words. The process is the same. At this point, the child learns consonant blends such as dr, dr in dragon, the gr, gr graph, and FL and flower, and many more. As children become confident building phonetic words, they can begin to read word lists, phrases, and sentences. At this time, simple sight words such as a, the, is, and has are introduced. The child can begin reading simple books. Emphasis is placed on comprehension. Does the child understand what was read? Tom can run fast and jump. Who is this sentence about? What can he do? How does he run? Does the child understand the events in a story? Montessori classrooms are equipped with a wide variety of reading material to accommodate children at various levels. This supports the Montessori principle that competition hinders learning. Each child works through the materials at his or her own pace and academic ability. There are no public score sheets or checklists posted in the classrooms. Teachers keep individual private notes on each child. Ideally, the child is enrolled in the same classroom with the same teacher for three years. This gives the child the gift of time. Goals for advancement are based on individual readiness. And handwriting, finally. Throughout the kindergarten year, teachers give individual and small group lessons on print handwriting. The children learn correct, correct letter formation, placement, and directionality. Practical life and sensorial lessons over the previous two years have helped prepare the child for handwriting. Thank you. Now we're moving to our cultural studies with Suda Vogel and Stacy Moon. Good evening, everyone. You have seen how children's learning is based on a hands-on exploration with the materials from the practical life, sensorial, math, and language areas. Stacy Moon and I are here to share with you how all these areas and the skills that your child has developed are harnessed in the cultural area. The cultural area of the classroom includes geography, botany, zoology, and physical science. Maria Montessori realized that to promote peace amongst nations, we have to begin with our children. Children as young as three years old can start laying the foundations of building understanding, compassion, and seeing the interconnectedness between their actions to the world around them. While exploring the rich content of the cultural area, young children are using and building upon the skills in observation, prediction, sequencing, categorizing, questioning, organizing, comparing and contrasting that they've had in their interactions 
with the materials from the other areas. Lessons in physical geography help young children in gaining an understanding of the world in which they live beyond their communities. Children as young as three years old begin by sorting objects and pictures according to whether they live on land, air, or water, which leads to looking at the land and water globe in the classroom. Extensions of these materials like pinpoking the land masses and assembling it into a globe tie in other curriculum areas like practical life, where a child's hands are strengthened to hone the pencil grip, language to match nomenclature cards and effectively sound out and read the labels and sensorial for spatial awareness and pattern recognition in assembling the intricate puzzle maps. In this photograph, you can see that this child has been poked the land masses, labeled them according to the continents, glued them onto the hemispheres, and then laced the two together to form the globe. He is so proud of his work and, and can often be seen standing and gazing up at it, perhaps amazed at his work. It has in turn inspired other children to want to attempt similar activities and even come up with their own unique ways of expressing their ideas. The continent globe helps the child make the connection between the land masses to the names of the continents. The next step is to see that a map of the hemispheres is actually a 2D representation of the continent globe. Children's attentions are brought from the part to the whole and then to the part again. It is a proud moment indeed when these young children become cartographers as they carefully trace, color, and label their maps. Giving children many opportunities to explore maps through puzzles, as well as presenting tactile exercises in land and water forms, even before presenting their names, deepens their understanding and helps them make the connections between the concrete and the abstract. In this photograph on the right, a young girl has used a clay sand to create her version of an island, and she was just three years old when she did this. Children's natural curio curiosity serves as a conduit to looking deeper into physical geography. Here, a student is fascinated by some fossils that she found on the geography shelf. Pre-elementary classrooms will often dive deeper into topics as diverse as plate tectonics, volcanoes, countries in different co continents, and outer space through their units of study. Our teachers can share many examples of out-of-the-box thinking, like using the red rods, knobbed and knobless cylinders, and the broad stairs from the cultural area to build the different types of volcanoes or the animals of the ocean biome that students in their classrooms have dem demonstrated. The accompanying photos show how this learning has transcended into the minds of these young learners and how they have been able to find new ways of using the sensorial material to give expression to their understanding of the animals in the ocean biome. I have to add that this was a totally organic process, not driven by suggestions or nudging by the teachers. What is also noteworthy is that it also shows how the older children serve as mentors in the learning outcomes of their younger friends in the classroom. Anna, a third year student, and Charlotte, a first year, working together, made a dolphin and a jellyfish. After a presentation of blue whales at our circle, Rayan and Sabir were inspired to come up with the blue whale and krill. I would like to share an anecdote. Our class was exploring the solar system and stars and galaxies. Upon viewing pictures of the galaxies and nebulas shared by the Hubble telescope, a discussion ensued about the types of stars like red giants and white dwarfs. A five-year-old boy with his eyes as wide as saucers turned to me and said, so when the stars blow up, they end up as a material for new universes to be created? And that's how the cycle goes on and on? Very often, physical geography leads to explorations in cultural geography of peoples, where they live, the types of climate they live in, 
what animals and plants live there, what people eat, how they dress and what they celebrate. When children see that people in the world might look different or wear different clothes, speak a different language, but have the same fundamental needs of food, clothing and shelter, they start understanding that everyone has so much in common. The cultural curriculum provides a wonderful segue in integrating Eaton School's mission statement of developing and nurturing global awareness. At the pre-elementary level, we do our part in upholding our diversity statement of championing, cultivating, and celebrating all members of our community so that we all participate as our full authentic selves and thereby become stronger in our shared diversity. We honor and celebrate the diversity of our students' cultural heritages, be it Diwali or the Lunar New Year, by hosting classroom celebrations. And now my um, colleague Stacy Moon will be leading you through the botany and zoology curriculum. Thank you. Uh, so Montessori botany lesson is an opportunity to introduce the environment, um, stimulate the senses, and to generate um, excitement about the wonders of mother nature for our children. And it's also a chance to um, illustrate the importance of sustainability um, and educate our kids about how we can protect um, the planet's fragile ecosystems. So botany is introduced um, using not uh, puzzles of a tree, um, a leaf, uh, and a flower that um, separate each part of the plant um, into a distinct puzzle piece. So children learn the names for each part and working with these materials um, helps children to become more observant uh, of the characteristics of things that grow in their own environments. So for example, a child on the left, um, she's learning to identify um, each part of a leaf um, and what they look like, how to take care, um, how to take care of them, um, how they grow, um, so that the children may appreciate uh, nature um, in a more organic way. So all botany studies um, are supported by experiments that illustrate how um, the plant meets its needs, how um, plant systems function, and the importance of plants um, to the ecosystem. And students are um, actively involved um, in growing, um, caring for, and observing plants in the classroom. And botany work also parallel, parallels um, studies in geography, history, and zoology um, that explore um, the role of uh, plants on earth. It's, and it's our goal that the children understand from these studies um, the interdependence of all life forms um, and custodial role humans must assume like to protect and preserve life on earth. And the study of zoology um, shows children, animals from all around the world, like where they live, where, what they eat, and how they're classified. And to begin their um, exploration, um, children are introduced to the concept of organic versus inorganic. Um, we read books about and discuss the needs of organic things soil, air, and water, um, and often exhibit real um, objects that the children can hold and study. And children create um, categories um, using objects and photos, dividing them into groups of organic and inorganic things, plants and animals, and vertebrates and invertebrates. And finally, um, the five vertebrate classes, fish, amphibian, reptile, bird, and mammal um, are introduced. Um, children learn about the variety of animals in each group, their distinct features, and the names of their body parts and their habitats. The 
The cultural area also includes physical sciences. Children are presented with opportunities to explore hands-on fundamentals of matter, solids, liquid, gas, flow to sink, measuring liquids, friction, planes, and simple machines. All these tie in with the curricula, with the activities from the physical and cultural geography, as well as from botany and zoology. The cultural area of the Montessori classroom is driven by the children's curiosity about the world around them. The three-year cycle prepares the child to not only broaden their awareness, but also deepen it. Teachers are able to gauge the level of interest and dwell deeper into a current topic that is being explored, thus making this area an organic one, one that follows the interests and abilities of the child in the classroom. We have all shared the five core curriculum areas, and yet there is so much more that goes on in our classrooms. This school year, we welcome back our enrichment teachers to share their talents with us. Ms. Poppy Louthan, Eaton School Librarian, comes into the classrooms weekly to read stories, guide listening comprehension, and offers books to the children to check out. Mr. Joey Crotty invites students up to the habitat area to build their nature awareness skills. Uh, in one of the classes a couple weeks ago, he, Mr. Crotty was telling a story about some gray wolves and he got all the children howling, which of course in itself was wonderful for them. But then a neighborhood dog started howling back and you couldn't have asked for anything more perfect. Senora Mendez exposes our students to Spanish vocabulary and the musicality of that language. And Miss Sarah Kesick, our school counselor, offers activities in social and emotional learning to guide our students in liking themselves. And Miss Eleanor Winthrow guides the children to express how much they like themselves through the performing arts curriculum. environment where children can grow emotionally, socially, physically, and spiritually can empower and can lead to empowering intellectual development. This is what we strive to offer your child at Eaton School. Thank you. Stop the share. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, teachers, that was wonderful. Um, there is a question in chat um, about the math curriculum. Um, how, do, how do children usually master, how old are children when they usually master addition, deduction, et cetera, of numbers within 50? Can someone respond to that question? And make sure you unmute yourself. I did. I think it depends on the child. Um, so we can't say, you know what, while your child is three, they're gonna do addition. If they're not doing addition at five, then something's wrong or, you know, you have to worry about it. So it depends on the addition. child. Yeah, it all depends on the child. Um, but usually Montessori curriculum is a three-year curriculum. What if my child missed the first year of preschool and joined as a four-year, as a, a four-year-old or a PK, P4? 
How does that change with the three-year cycle? I can take that and anyone can jump in as well. We accept the children for where they are. We just take them and we just start assessing their skills and just start building up from there. They're not, they didn't miss out on anything. It just gives us a slate on where to start. There's no, it, it's, it's totally fine. They're not missing. We just know when to jump in because we just totally accept where they are. Um, I'm not sure I understand this question. What is the school day for 2022 spring? Um, maybe come, would you rephrase that and we'll come back to that. Um, how often do kids move from one subject area to another in a week? I can take that one. Um, it's very organic. Um, to, as I said, in mine, teachers are taking individual notes. So it's just like, you know, a child comes in and it's like, oh, you did your language work yesterday. Let's start, you know, start with your math today. You know, so it's not um, that you're here, you're here, you're here. You know, a lot of times, and I like the term guided choice. I learned from Miss Gaskins many years ago. Um, the, the children are like, um, and it depends upon the age too. You know, the younger ones are going to gravitate more to practical life at first um, and then to sensorial. And the, the older children, by the time they're in kindergarten, we have more expectations that they are getting into being a little bit more academic. So that's where we're, we're guiding them. So um, it's not that they're doing what the thing. Also that we follow, you might have a, the one story I love to tell. I had a boy for three years. His three years could be summed up with water, math, reading. The first year he was always in water. We heard water running. We knew it was Alex. Um, the second year he was really into math. He wanted to do the chain so hard. It got over a hundred and it was hard, but he worked at it. He learned it. And I'm like, okay, come on. We need to work some, some sounds. We got to do that. And it was kind of a push by the third year it clicked and he was reading. So it just, it's also, it's follow the child too. Great. Hope that, um, that answered it. <laughs> Um, in the independent task completion setting, how would a teacher help guide a student to cope with frustration? Would the student need to wait for the teacher's attention? Someone. <laughs> so how, how do you how do you work with a child who might be frustrated with an activity? Um, does a child need to wait for you? What's your process around that? I think for most of us, because we're observing a lot of the time, we can pretty much tell. Obviously, the idea is to get to the child before he or she gets frustrated. But uh, if we can see it's happening, we scooch over there as quickly as possible and we isolate the difficulty. We'll limit the distraction or just, I'm thinking of, certain uh, materials that have several, several pieces, if we just take out a lot and cover up what they're not gonna use, so then it's, uh, like we said, isolate the difficulty for whatever it could be. If it's cutting with scissors, we'll hold the paper. We can just find a way to um, break the activity down. And if we don't get to that child, we're so lucky to have our assistants in our classrooms too. They can come come over and help, or often, more often than not, an older student will come over and say, oh, I can help you with that. And I'm going to add a little bit to that. Um, the children are in, in slightly different developmental cycles in, within this three-year cycle in the classroom or two or even one year if they come in as a kindergartner. And they're drawn to materials that speak to them. And so they have more success because they're drawn to these materials that they're comfortable with. It's developmentally within their range to understand. And part of that frustration too sometimes is working through that frustration and figuring out how to do it successfully. And that's a really important piece in terms of learning to problem solve. Um, but we are there to help guide children as well. Um, are there targets to meet at the end of each year? Benchmarks. Mm 
what we're looking for as teachers is progress. So we can kind of see where the child is starting and that kind of gives us a clue to where the child will be. Maybe not at the end of the school year, we're looking for progress within every four weeks. So we're constantly assessing those children. What you have an expectation you have for one child of a certain age will, could be very different from a, the, a child the same age, but different skill abilities, different cognitive abilities. So we have individual targets, not for the whole group, and but they're constantly being assessed. Um, a question about collaboration. Um, I was wondering what percentage of activities are designed for collaboration, um, i.e. an activity that needs two to three participants. Um, the reason I asked is I imagine younger children may be shy to ask for help or ask for others to participate in their activities. So what does that look like? I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, I think collaboration actually usually happens naturally in a Montessori classroom. We wouldn't say that activities are designed for it. And they usually want to reach out to their friends. Interaction happens constantly, not just in the sensorial area, in language as well. And it is very much encouraged because we would like them to develop the social skills as well, problem solving skills. And if there's conflict, that's when we help guide them how to solve the conflict. So it happens constantly. Um, you know, sometimes in the morning they can be very social and they want to work together. And if we see that they can be unpurposeful, that's when the teacher would step in and say, okay, you know, I think we need to work by ourselves for a few minutes. Um, and also it depends on the skills of the children. Usually the three-year-old, they don't need to collaborate too much. Um, the older, older uh, peers love to help, but working together with older peers usually is not the thing that they seek because they still in, you know, in that three-year-old uh, plane of development where they just love to be by themselves because they don't have the vocabulary to, to reach out to older friends yet. It happens a lot between second year students and third year students. Mm -hmm like a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, with COVID, are group times reduced? And is that of any concern? The group times may not be reduced. The number of children at a group are reduced. A teacher may present, if she has group lessons, for the day, she might present that group lesson two times a day. So only seven children are there at a time. Uh, so I think that's, that's how I think it works best. Yeah, and as you saw in the, the, the different enrichment uh, pictures, the children are really spaced out too. So you actually can have a whole group, but we're just spacing kids out. And um, as I walk by classrooms and gaze in, if a teacher's having a group for the whole group, some children are sitting in the, at, at the circle, some children are sitting back in chairs so that there's distance between the children. And it's amazing how resilient they are um, and they just get it. They're just so capable with all this. Um, can you describe the first assessment to evaluate the child's capability in terms of math, English, math, et cetera, say for a four-year-old? Uh, progress reports? <laughs> no, so, no. so we don't do a formal assessment. It's, you guys talk about observation because that's what's really being asked here. How do you observe um, the capabilities of a child and when they're ready to move on to something else? What's that process look like? So during the day when the children are working, 
a lot is going on during their independent work time. That's when they're getting individual lessons or small group lessons. And then that's also when they are making their independent choices. And it doesn't take long for those new students to realize when they come into the classroom that they may make the free choice on materials from which they've had a presentation. Or they come up to us and say, oh, may I have a lesson with this? And then the third option for that is we go to them and say, oh my goodness, you've done this work so many times, now I know you're ready for the next lesson. But it's during that observation time that not only do we observe what the child is doing, but how they're going about it. Was it a free choice? Are they using it purposefully each time? Are they coming up with a new way to do it? That's the, those are you know the real positive uh, clues for us, but also things we're kind of looking is it, are they choosing that same thing all the time because maybe he or she is unsure of what to do next. And again, that's when we step in and say, oh, you are so ready for the next activity. Uh, in terms of English, I'm, I'm thinking if you're speaking about spoken language English, we are so fortunate that our classrooms, uh, the curriculum is designed like uh, through the senses that Calson was talking a lot. Everything is presented visually first before we add language. So the child only has to, con to focus on one present presentation part of that. And then language is put afterwards. So they don't fall behind, fall behind, that's a rude word, but they don't lag because they don't have the vocabulary to put towards it. They're still working with the materials and language is basically almost the last part that comes to it. That's kind of how I see the answer to this. I would encourage other teachers to jump in. I think if, I, if I may add, I think, um, you know, um, the obs you know, teachers as observers is a big, big part here. And I think, um, as Susan has already mentioned, uh, many of the things that we look for, I think we also look for um, how independently is this child able to perform the task? Mm -hmm. you know, are they asking for help with every, you know, is getting stuck? Are they getting frustrated? You know, or what about with how much concentration are they able to complete the task? And I think those are all the clues that we get when we observe the child. And I think that uh, really gives us a um, big idea about whether the child is ready for that next step. Part of the Montessori teacher training program, um, a huge part is learning how to observe children at work and understand what the child, where the child is in the learning process. Um, how, how do teachers distribute their time amongst all the different children in the classroom every day? Considering all the, you know, all the activities going on all of the time. I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer that. I think that's the reason why we help children develop the independence it's a huge thing in Montessori because the more independent your child is, the farther they can go in their learning. Because children that are independent and they don't wait for teachers. If teacher is busy, they just go do something. And, you know, as long as they have been given a lesson and sometimes if they haven't been given a lesson, they just do it because they say, I saw you show this lesson to someone, so I'm going to attempt it. And that is what we want in our students. Um, so independence is key to, you know, the drive within themselves. They want to do something. They want to pick something. There's so many things to do. And at the beginning of the year, yes, teachers will get a little... Uh, it, it could be a little overwhelming, but we did have record keeping. We would contract um, who needs new lessons and who have had enough lessons that can just go repeat the lessons that they have been given. 
But once they know what to do, they're so independent. Teachers really do just observe a lot so that we can keep track, like what Susan was saying, which child needs to be introduced a new lesson because this child has been repeating the same lesson and needs to be invited to a new lesson. So for me, the independence is the key. Like not waiting for teachers to tell them what to do. Okay, um, I'm gonna answer the next question. It's about lunch. Um, children are eating at their own tables because of COVID. Normally we have groups of tables uh, where children are sitting. There could be three or four children at a group of tables um, eating together, but because of COVID, we have spaced children out. So until we can um, get past this, children are eating at their own tables, but it's also a very social environment because there's a, a short time of silent eat, eat, eating, so the children are encouraged to eat lunch. But then there's a social time too, where they can talk to each other. Um, so you know we're balancing out that social piece, even though they can't be sitting right next to each other. Um, let's see. Uh, with the child, um, the child's progress. How is that shared with children, with parents um, in a regular fashion or how does that happen? So how do you share progress with parents? Okay, I think um, I can um, answer that one. Um, we have um, two, um, uh, we send our progress reports twice a year, which are written and uh, communicated with parents. And then we also have tw uh, twice a year conferences, parent conferences uh, in the fall and in the spring. So those are wonderful opportunities for us to touch base and uh, um, you know, have conversations about how the child is doing in the classroom. And um, I think more than anything else, our, um, our emails are always open. And uh, you know, that's how we primarily communicate with parents. And, uh, you know, because of the, the amount of observation that we are doing, we can easily um, send out an email to a parent if we find that, you know, something is uh, amiss or even dropping a line saying, uh, I just love having a child in my classroom, such a wonderful worker. And we have another tool, we have Seesaw, and we communicate a lot about what is happening, um, you know, um, on a weekly base basis uh, through photographs, with a little comment about what a child is doing or maybe what our whole classroom is doing. So these are all wonderful opportunities for us to keep the lines of communication open. Right. Um, and with Seesaw, I just, I want parents to understand too, you know, the first couple months of school, the teachers are deeply invested in helping the class settle down, assessing children, getting into a routine. Um, and so Seesaw, you may not get, you won't get daily pictures, hopefully you get weekly pictures, um, but once the classroom settles down, then there's more Seesaw communication as well. So that's important to know. Um, can the teacher provide higher level materials, for example, that normally are given to a kindergartner if a younger child seems interested? or is ready or wants to challenge him or herself. I think that is the beauty of the uh, three-year cycle in a multi-age classroom. We follow the child and when we follow the child, it means um, we, we have an, it's almost like having an individual uh, education plan for each child. And uh, so, so there is really no boundary there is nothing that is holding a child back. I think, um, you know, so we will definitely uh, be willing and able to introduce a child who's showing readiness for all those uh, things that an older child might be doing. And because, you know, it's, it's so fluid and it's, um, it's, it's seamless. And, uh, and I think um, it's just, uh, it's a joy to watch uh, children wanting to do what uh, some of their older peers are doing and uh, being inspired by that. And um, definitely, this is there's nothing holding them back. 
Okay, we're going to do one more question and then I'm going to turn this over to Sonia Eversen. Um, will Hot Lunch from the external company come back? Yes, it will. Um, we, we're still in um, Delta COVID protocols at Eaton School. And our hot lunch program has to, our hot lunches have to be delivered across four buildings. And so we're physically, we don't feel comfortable having um, that happen across our campus. Um, and so once we get past some of these uh, protocols that are put through by our licensing agencies, then I'm Sharon Gonzalez who is back in her normal role of auxiliary program coordinators already researching hot lunch companies. So as soon as we can, we'll bring it back and we'll be sure to communicate that out to families ahead of time. So um, I'm gonna say thank you for everyone for coming. Um, and I wanna turn this over to Sonia so she can talk about some future learning events. Yeah. Hi everybody. Thank you so much, um, pre-elementary teachers. That was every year just so informative. Um, my name is Sonia Everson. I'm the director of admission here. So for those of you who are um, not yet Eaton families, I wanted to let you know of a couple opportunities um, to continue learning about our program. Um, I host weekly on-campus tours. We stay outside of the classrooms, but that's a great opportunity to come and visit the campus um, and see the classrooms in action, see what these teachers are talking about in action. Um, you can sign up for that on our our admission page. There's also an open house opportunity for adults only, please, and you must show proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test to attend, um, but that's on Saturday, November 6th, and the teachers will be here to talk with you and answer more of your questions. You can see the materials in person. Um, and then for those of you who have kindergarten students, our lower elementary curriculum night is just next Tuesday on October 12th. So that's another great learning opportunity um, for you. Applications are available now um, for the 22-23 school year. They're due February 14th. So you've got lots of time to connect with us further, learn more about us, um, make sure we're a great fit school for you and your family. So please reach out. Again, my name is Sonia Everson. Um, I'm the director of admission here and I look forward to meeting you all in the future. Thanks so much for attending tonight. Thank you.